Father, we just uh, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, for, Lord, for this evening, Lord. I know everybody has a story about something that happened today, Lord, that um, might have tripped them up, Lord, or made them wonder, man, am I even going to make it through the day, Lord? Or Our days just seem to be crazier and crazier, Lord, and it's not a surprise as we look around us as to what's going on in our world, Lord. But, but Lord, help us to keep our eyes focused on you, to keep our eyes focused in your word as well, Lord. For it's only by your word that we, and through your spirit that we can understand what's going on around us, Lord. And as we're going to read tonight, Lord, we are in the last days. So, Father, I just be with us, Lord. May uh, the words that come out of my mouth be your words, Lord. And as my wife aptly prays all the time, Lord, if, if I say something that I, is wrong or incorrect, that people like Juan wouldn't even be able to hear me. He'd be like, what was that? What did he say, Lord, that you would just... Just nullify uh, anything that is incorrect, please, Father. But Lord, by your Holy Spirit, just teach us tonight, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn to First John. It's, um, it's been a couple months, actually, since I've, I've been back to, uh, or had an opportunity uh, to teach. I've been uh, trying to go through First John at men's study, and I know a few months ago, one of my uh, the communion services I was able to teach and and I and I did it out of First John and I wanted to get to chapter three so David Pastor David could um, you know behold what manner of love right so we could play that right but we're not going to get there you know because that's a good song and. And maybe it's my little bit of ADHD that I have, and I'm like, well, I, I can't skip ahead. I got to do things in order. Are you like that? I, you have to do things in order. I can't jump around. So, so that leaves me <laughs> with some uh, the fun part of First John chapter two, starting in verse 18. That's where we're going to start tonight. So while you're turning to First John. Uh, 218. Let's just do a quick review. All right, first John. Who's the author? John. John. You guys are smart. Uh, John was a, before he came to Christ, he was a fisherman, right? And his father's name was Zebedee, right? And we think that the family was pretty, you know, I mean, they may be well off. They certainly weren't poor. Why do we think that? They had a connection with the high priest, but they also had a business, right? That's right, and employees, right? Now, just because you have a business with employees doesn't, you know, mean that you're rolling in the dough, does it? But um, they weren't scraping mud um, to get by. Uh, who was his brother? James, right? Also known as James the Greater. And what was their nickname? Sons of Thunder, right? You know? Uh, this fishing business, who, who were they in business with? Peter and Andrew, very good. That's right. And along with James, Peter, and Andrew, they were followers of who before Jesus? John the Baptist. Excellent. You got it. And um, <clears throat> John is one of the uh, select inner circle, right, of the apostles. He was present at the raising of Jairus' daughter, present at the Transfiguration, right? He was in the inner group at the, in the garden. Uh, he was only the one of the four that got the Mount of Olives briefing, right, in the Olivet Dis Discord. Uh, so John, you know, had an, you know, quite an insight and quite, uh, quite a connection, right, with uh, the ministry of Jesus. Uh, it's interesting. We always seem to find John and Peter together. Who was the oldest probably in the group? Peter, who was the youngest? John, John. interesting, right? You know? Um, you know, John and Peter were the first to arrive at the tomb. Well, the ladies were, but, you know, of, of the apostles, right? And what did Peter learn about John? He runs faster, <laughs> yep. And who reminded Peter of that? John, John did. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see, John was persecuted and banished to Patmos, right? Uh, then John settled in Ephesus after the fall of Jerusalem. And now, isn't it always interesting when you try to look up dates as to when certain books were written? And you go to this resource, and they say it was here and this other, right? So we have to kind of take, you know, dates, you know, <clears throat> liberally here. But it is thought, it is generally thought, that 1 John was written around 90 AD, 2 John around the same time. I read somewhere that people actually thought that 3 John was written before any of the Johns were written. So possibly shortly after he arrived in Ephesus, after the fall of uh, Jerusalem. And then the last book that John wrote was the last book, the book of Revelation, right? And where did he write all these letters from? Well, you know, after Patmos, where did he settle? Ephesus, Ephesus right? I said that earlier. Yeah. So all these were written from, um, from Ephesus. And uh, John is also known as the apostle of love, love right? Well, here, you're in chapter 2. Keep your finger there. Turn to chapter 1, verse 6. Actually, I'll start in verse 5 here, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, you lie. You're a liar. All right? And you do not practice the truth. Well, that's not very loving, is it? You know, John, you know, well, he is the apostle of love, right? The problem is, what do we do in our current culture. We like to redefine words, don't we? And so if you don't agree with what I say, and I feel that you're judging me, then I'm saying that you're unloving, right? Uh, and so today people would, would read uh, what John has to say and go, that's not very loving of John. I mean, and we're going to find out that he has some other unquote unquote loving things to say tonight. Um, What's the purpose of writing this epistle? Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So John's going to say some hard things to us, but he wants, and he's doing it because he wants our joy to be full. And if we go to the end, chapter 5, let's go to verse 13. These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. What does John want us to do? He wants to remember that you're saved. You have salvation. You have eternal life. All right. Let's go back to, let's go to our text tonight and start in verse 18 here. Little children... It is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. How do we know that we are currently in the end of the age? How do we know? He says it right here, right? What does he say? There's been how many? Many Antichrists, right? What's an Antichrist? Uh, uh, all right. Pastor Ritt recently, I can't remember if it was during Ben's study or if it was on a Wednesday or a, or a, a Sunday, uh, went through the definition of an antichrist. All right? Anti doesn't mean like what we think, like against, right? I'm against you, all right? Anti means instead of, actually, right? Another, a substitution. Now, think about it. Satan really has never had an original thought in his head. What does he want to do? He wants to counterfeit, to copy everything that God does, right? He sets up his, his own uh, ministries, sets up his own trinity and, and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to go through some of that um, tonight as well. <clears throat> but let's just go back. This, little, this term, little children... This is a term of endearment 
as from an elderly father. Uh, John, he, he lived and died an old man. That's how he passed. Natural causes, right? Uh, and he, if he is writing this around the 90s, in a 90 AD, he's at the end of his life. Not a, lot, a lot of this stuff has gone on, right? And he has seen it, and, and, and he looks at the church, and especially the church in Ephesus, as, the, as his children. And so he has this term of endearment, little children. You know, he's not being condescending, like, you're too young to understand this, and so let me explain it to you, right? That's not, that's not what he's, he's, he's saying here. He, he, he has this caring, he has this shepherding heart as a pastor. And this is the last hour. Um, so, I, what did I did, did some math. Okay, if this was written in 90 AD and this is 2023, that was 1,933 years ago. So if that was the last hour almost 2,000 years ago, what are we in today? You know, last milliseconds, you know, of the age, right? Um, so beyond the shadow of a doubt, we are in the last day, right? Um, it's, it's interesting, too, uh, what is the word that we use for the study of end times? Eschatology, Eschatology right? And this word last here, uh, the, the Greek word is um, ekatos, which means last, right? And so it's the last in the study of the last things, right? That's where we get the word eschatology from. And then it's interesting, as you have heard that the, the Antichrist is coming with a capital A, right? So we're talking about a specific person. Even now, so he's talking about during his day, many Antichrists have come. Uh, it's interesting, and this surprised me that the word Antichrist used by John, is only ever used in the John epistles. First John, here in 2.18, later in verse 22, in chapter 4, verse 3, and then also in 2 John uh, 7. It's not used in the book of Revelation. I was like, really? So I had to go look. It's not. Not in my translations, you know, um, is the word antichrist used. So he only uses that term four times. Um, and here in this verse, uh, he's using the word antichrist as a, a definition as a, a spirit that is in the world that opposed or denies Christ. Um, it's also used to mean the false teachers who employ the spirit. And we also use it as a specific leader, a satanic superman, I read somewhere. You know, they put it, who will head up the final world rebellion against Christ, the Antichrist, right? And John uses those, th those three, you know, Antichrist, these three different ways right here in this one verse. Um, now, John is also going to go on and he's going to talk about false teachers that have the spirit of, of Antichrist, right? And he's going he's to talk about how they depart from the fellowship of believers, how they deny the faith, and then they try to deceive the faithful. So they depart, they deny, they deceive. So you get that? Three, they all begin with the same letter, right? Just like, you know. That was a joke. Bad joke. <laughs> depart, deny, deceive, okay? Um, all right, they depart from the fellowship of believers, verse nine, starting in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Wow, that's a lot of us's in there, right? They went out from us. All okay. right, as I said, they departed from the fellowship of believers. Think of a lot of the false teachers that we have today. Where do they come from? The church, right? And some of them are still in the false church, right? Uh, I mean, look at Andy Stanley, right? Who's his dad? 
Charles, right? He's, I think Charles is, he's, yeah, but he is, or was, I guess, right? He was a great teacher. I would not consider him a false teacher, would I? What do you consider Andy? So he came out, right? He came out of the faithful. Um, Fertick, right? Didn't he go to Greenville, North Greenville University? Isn't that where he went to college up there? And until recently, his church was part of the Southern Baptist Convention? You know? Um, I think it sounds like he had a decent start, right? But no, he came out. Now he's you know, teaching a lot of falsehoods. They went out from us. But as we learn, just because they're with us doesn't mean they're of us, right? But they were not of us, it says, you know, continues in verse 19. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. So when, you know, God is God. And why do some people walk straight lines with the Lord? And why do some people fall off the edge of the cliff? I don't know, right? It's the sovereignty of God. And we've covered that many times uh, um, here at, at this church. But if they had been with us, or, or had, had they been of us, they would never have left us. And it's that, that thought of, well, was he saved? Or did he backslide or, or what, right? And guys, I don't know if you remember what I said in men's Bible study a couple months ago when we covered another part of this text um, about people who are falling away. It's not over until the fat lady sings, right? And, you know, not until it's over, all right? And so, you know, we, we, some of, we see some of these people that have left the faith today, and they're still walking, they're still breathing, they still have a chance, right? We don't know. We don't know the end of their story, right? Now, somebody falls away, and, and it looks like uh, their fruit is bad, right? Uh, they're teaching a bunch of, you know, you know false uh, gospel, and then they die. Well, of course, we're not God. Praise God, we're not God, right? Only God knows. But from the outside looking in, we would go, hmm, they didn't finish well. Maybe they weren't even of, um, of us, right? So all that to say, if you're of God, you don't need to worry about it, right? He's going to keep you, and he'll keep you in the fellowship. Do y'all sin? Yeah. Who's, somebody said, a cu- of course. Yeah, of course we sin, don't we, right? You know, and... But if you know that you are of God and, and you make a bad choice, you do something you know, oh, man, I shouldn't have done that, right? Did you lose your salvation? No. And one says you were always saved, right? So you are always of us. I think what you find, though, is as you get more mature in the Lord over time, that when you make these, you trip up and you make these mistakes, you are a lot quicker to get back on your knees right away and repent of whatever you just did, Right? You know, in the old days, I might have held out for a couple months. You know, I'm not going to, right? You know, now, you know, praise God, maybe I'll, I'll hold out for a couple of hours <laughs> before. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So we have to see these people leave the church so that we know, yes? Can you think of anybody that has gone the wrong way? and found the way back. Yourself or you know somebody? Myself. Okay. John Michael says himself. Anybody else? No? It would be like when you turn 18 and go out in the world and then you sure. 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 I think, I think, Juan, you were more so asking of a Bible teacher right, right. that kind of fell away and then, you know, came back. Off the top of my head, I can't think of, of anything. Um, but you're putting me on the spot, so. <laughs> I'm having a hard enough time, you know, <laughs> standing, holding it together up here right now. Pastor Red, you make it look easy. <laughs> but, you know, 
What's good and what is bad? How would we know that something is bad? How do we, how do we know that something is good? We have to have something to compare it to, right? In the human world, right? You know, this, this tastes sweet and this tastes sour, so therefore I know that this is good to me and this is bad, right? And so if we didn't have those that are walking away from the Lord, how do we know that then those that are staying are, are true? You know? Again, who has the mind of Christ? Well, we have the mind of Christ, but who has the mind of God? Right? I can't understand that. Um, be good Bereans. Amen. All right, where was I going with this? All right, we know them by their works, right? James tells us that a truly a born again believers will produce fruits and the fruits of the Spirit, right? Uh, we are not, it's not our job to judge one another's salvation, is it, right? But as it has been said many times, we are fruit inspectors. Now, if somebody walks in here and says, I don't believe in God, and then they go live like they don't believe in God, then what, do we, what can we say, right? They're living, they're, they're actually being more honest than, you know, some believers are, right? But if somebody comes in, and maybe you have a family member, right? And they go, I'm a Christian, and I believe in God. And then they go off with their boyfriend, and they go live together and, and so on and so forth, we go, well, that's not the fruit I'm seeing in your life, right? So we, we can be fruit inspectors and we, we need to speak that truth into their lives, right? In love. And sometimes speaking it into their lives involves more time on your knees than it does actually using your mouth. You understand what I'm saying? Um, 1 Corinthians 11 I'll just read this verse real quick. First, First Corinthians eleven nineteen says, "There must be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you." Find that interesting. I, I thought that was kind of like, yeah. Um, it would be so much nicer, wouldn't it, if just everybody was who they were, or everybody was who they say they were? Does that make sense? I could just take. One says that. That he's a born again believer and he and he loves God and I won't have to ever think anything about that. You know? When was the last time you spoke to somebody and they they didn't keep their word? Probably almost you know, how many politicians have you ever spoken to? Right? <laughs> you know? Um, but there has to be factions among us so that the approved can be recognized among you. First Timothy 1.4 talks about the, the great apostasy, right? And the, the falling away. And, um, but it is a very dangerous world out there for the believer. Second uh, Timothy chapters three and four talk about perilous times and perilous men, you know, in the last days, you know, perilous times will come upon us, right? Tw I was thinking about this, 20 years ago, we moved from Western New York to South Carolina. We had an awesome church back in Western New York. And we moved down to South Carolina, and before we started coming here, it was almost two years, trying to find a church in Greenville, South Carolina. And well, you know how hard it is to find a church in Greenville, South Carolina? There's a church in every corner, right? But to find a church that felt like home, that taught the Word of God, that was... It was so hard. And, uh, but, you know, maybe there, I think I did research 20 years ago, I think in the greater Greenville, Spartanburg, Anderson area, there was like 1,400 churches. That's a lot of churches. What percentage of those churches do you think, you know, are sound Bible teaching churches? 2%? <laughs> Pastor, they got it. 2%. They... <laughs> Maybe, yeah. You know, 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about destructive doctrines. There are so many churches out there that are teaching a false gospel. It's destruct... It is destructive to your, um, your sal salvation, to your faith. Uh, so, you know, we are called to stay in fellowship. Stay in church. But I didn't like the way the pastor said that last week. I don't 
think they do X, Y, Z often enough. I don't like the way that that worship guy leads the worship team. I don't like, I don't like, I don't, I don't like the coffee. I don't like that, you know, it goes on and on and on. And what do people do? They leave over the small stuff. Again, how hard was it? I know, I know some of y'all, y'all's story on trying to find a church in this area. You want to go back to that? Now, if you go to a church and the pastor is teaching heresy, what are you supposed to do? Run, right? Get out of there. Le- leave, right? Um, but you know, praise God. I mean, we have a fellowship of believers here that love the word of God. We have a pastor that loves to rightly divide the truth and, and to speak it and to share. And he is not a scared, is he, to share some hard things with us. He gets nervous. He's a man, right? Just like the rest of us. He gets nervous when we have to say something hard, right? Uh, but as, as our pastor keeps imploring us, we need to fear God over man, Right? Next week, what's happening a week from tomorrow? How many of you guys are going to be in family members that aren't believers? All right? And there might be some topics that might need that come up. You know, be in prayer. I don't, don't start a food fight or anything like that. But, you know, be in prayer. Maybe, you know, you have to say something. All right? Um, but let, let God lead you on that. Um, Pastor Ridd didn't say go home and fight. <laughs> with the family, uh, but we are to stand up for the truth. All right, moving on. Verse uh, 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. You have an anointing of the Holy One, and you know all things. You know what that makes you? A bunch of know it alls. You know it all, right? We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. This is the same Holy Spirit that was in the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul. It's the same Holy Spirit that spoke things into creation, right? You know, the same power. Uh, It's interesting that this word anointing, charisma, uh, anybody have a King James Bible? Or know what the King James Bible, Bible says instead of an anointing. So it's a word that's not used very often. Now, if you use um, uh, some some like apothecary type of medication, you know, an unction. Ever heard of an unction? You know, kind of like an oil, right? Unction or anointing in this case is the act of applying oil or an oily liquid to the head or some other part of the body especially in order to dedicate a person or object to a particular service or function. You have been anointed by the Holy One to his, to his service. We have a purpose, right? Christian, you have a purpose. You have a role to play. Um, and we know all these things, especially if you've been sitting in this sanctuary for a couple of years, you, you've been taught some things that many pe- you know, um, folks in seminary have never been taught even, right? Um, 1 John uh, 2, 27, so if we jump down from um, verse 20 here down to verse 27, uh, but the anointing which you have received, the same word here, from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has, it has taught you, you will abide in him. We also see that uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, I'll just read these to you. Uh, now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So this anointing, it's it's not just so that you can understand, 
but it's a guarantee as to who you belong to, what your future is, where you're going. All right. Let's go down to verse 22. There's some more loving words from John. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So what's the one thing that we say here every Sunday morning before we start our services? The Apostles' Creed. Let me see if I can zip over to... Where did my notes go? No, no, no. Click the wrong thing. <laughs> That's the danger of having electronics up here. All right. The first two statements, John Michael, of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, There you go. Yeah, I'm, he I'm hearing it. All right. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Right? So, he who has the Spirit, right? He acknowledges the Son. He has the Father also. All right. But who would ever deny that God is the Father, or deny that Jesus is the Son? Who would ever deny? Many people. Many people, right? Well, how about pastors? Quote, unquote, pastors. Uh, according to a study done in 2022 by Barna and the Cultural Research Center of Arizona Christian University. All right, you ready to pull your hair out? Just 37% of Christian pastors have a biblical worldview with a predominant Worldview among pastors, 62% being secretionism, a hybrid mixture of disparate worldview elements blended into a customized philosophy of life. Doesn't that just kind of describe what the Christian dumb is today, right? A hybrid blending of, of a customized philosophy of life. Whatever you want it to be, you can, that, that's what it should be. 41% of senior and lead pastors. Have a biblical, biblical world view. Well, praise God, 41%, but only 41% of senior pastors have a biblical world view. And that's the highest among all different pastoral positions. Uh, David, help me remember. I think there was another study that, that we saw. Something like 12% of youth pastors have a biblical world view. 13% of Sunday school pastors have a biblical world view. These are the Folks that are raising, you know, sharing the gospel and, and, the, and the word with our children and our teenagers. 12%. 2%. And the chosen doesn't have a biblical worldview. Yeah. Um, specifically, the report found that one third or more of senior pastors believe, okay, so 33% or more of senior pastors believe the following things. Sexual relations between two unmarried people who, have, who believe they love each other is morally acceptable. Okay, problem, right? Determining moral truth is up to each individual. There are no moral absolutes that apply to everyone all the time. These are senior pastors. Okay? The Holy Spirit is not a living entity but is a symbol of God's power, presence, and purity. This is what senior pastors, third, over a third of the senior pastors believe. Having faith matters more than which faith you have. Having faith matters more than which faith you have. It doesn't matter what you believe in, as long as you believe in something. All right? Basically is what that's saying. Reincarnation is, is a real possibility. A person who is generally good or does enough good things for others can earn a place in heaven. Socialism is preferable to capitalism. 
allowing property ownership uh, facilitates economic injustice. So owning something, you're, you're, you're not nice people. All right. Uh, the Bible is ambiguous, ambiguous in its teaching about abortion, enabling you to make a strong argument either for or against abortion based on biblical principles. We saw that in an election a couple years ago, right? The senator over in, he was a pastor in Georgia, right? And he, he ran as a senator and got elected. And he's a pastor and, and he was pro-choice all the way, pro-death all the way. Okay, additionally, now a one third or more of senior pastors reject the following. That, that was what they believe in. Now, this is what they reject. They reject the following beliefs. Human life is sacred. Wealth is entrusted to individuals to be managed for God's purposes. Success is consistent obedience to God. They reject that. Success is consistent obedience to God. So don't be obedient to God, you know, is what they're... Because they aren't. People are born into sin. They reject this. People are born into sin can only be saved from its consequences by Jesus Christ. They personally will experience eternal salvation only because they have personally confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They reject that. Over a third of senior pastors. Verse 22 who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. I'm sure you've heard these numbers before, but it, it doesn't matter how many times I, I, I hear this. It it's, shocks me, you know. Um, it makes me think of those 1,400 churches in the upstate 20 years ago. You know, this was, that was 20 years ago I was talking about when we were looking. This was done in 2022. Um, and we know things have gotten worse since then. Okay? So that's the bad news, right? How about some good news? Or at least some encouragement, right? Verse 24, therefore, okay. So all this other stuff I've just been sharing with you, all right, now what are we going to do about it? Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Let's go back to the creed, right? Statement number 12, John Michael is what? And life Everlasting, right? Do you remember the first time you heard about Jesus? The gospel message was, was shared with you and your eyes were opened and you were just like, what? Really? I don't know about you. You know, it brought me to my knees and, and I, I'm not a crying, well, back then I wasn't a crying guy, you know. But when you realize who you are before God and what God has done for you, wow, right? So that simple truth that was shared with me 36 years ago now, um, if I let that abide in me, right? And hopefully I've been a good steward and, and so that what was shared with me has been deposited, right? And I've nurtured it and has grown and, and matured. And, and hopefully now there's a lot more in me, right, than what was deposited 30 something years ago, right? But we need to not forget where we came from and what changed us, right? If it abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. Verse 26, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. So John's like, I'm, I've been warning you, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share these things so that you don't get deceived. But, all right, so I've shared these things to you, right? But 
the anointing, right, this unction, right, the, this gift of the Holy Spirit, this knowledge, right, this power, which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Again, a bunch of know-it-alls, right? But what, what does our pastor always tell you when it comes to reading the Word of God? And guys, I think he shared this at, at the men's study a few weeks ago, right? When, when we study the Word, what are we supposed to do? Read it, and read it, and reread it, right? And then pray about, what am I reading? Because what do we want to happen? We want that, that spirit within us, the Holy Spirit within us, to illuminate, what am I reading, right? Yeah. Before the Holy Spirit dwelt in my heart, I read the Bible. It didn't. I didn't understand a word I was reading. It was sawdust. It was blah. You know, when I graduated, when I graduated high school, I was given this really nice, I should have brought it, I still have it, a really nice little King James leather Bible, right? And it's about, you know, about yay big, and it had the little snap flap, and you could, I could put it in my back pocket, and, and uh, it was given to me by this dear old family friend. Uh, she was a true Southern lady um, uh, that, that my family met when we were stationed at um, Barksdale Air Force Base in the uh, Shreveport area, Louisiana. And what did I do with that Bible when she gave it to me? Nothing. I, in fact, I tossed it in a box and it went to the attic for the next four years or so, right? I might think to myself, I'd rather have gotten a pair of socks. At least I could use a pair of socks. You know, I remember thinking that. And, uh, but as my eyes were starting to be opened, right, I went back to my parents' house. I went in the attic. I dug that Bible out, and that was my first real Bible that I started reading. That was King James. I was just like, uh, thee, thou, uh, you know. It's, and the print was really small, right? But I, st I love that little thing. But it just reminds me, and, and you know, just think, I get to meet Dorothy Hefley when I get to heaven, right? And she had a part, you know, in my salvation, you know, story. She watered, provided you know, the word in my, in my life, you know. Um, so she, she passed before that ever happened. So, she, you know, she was not alive when I came to the Lord. But these things I have written to you concerning those who tried to deceive you, okay, and that you do not need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, it is true, it is not a lie, just as you will abide in him. All right. Um, verse 28. I want to repeat myself, and we are hitting the top of the hour. So now, little children, again, this affectionate calling of the children of the church at Ephesus, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. All right, again, talking about abiding, abiding in the truth, abiding with what uh, has been given to us, right? And um, isn't it interesting how different people's teachings all kind of connect? Because just recently, Pastor Ritt was talking about standing before, as a, as a believer, standing before, you know, the Bema Seat of Christ, right? And that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, that when He appears, when the Lord appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Uh, so we stand before uh, Jesus. I already gave it away. It's the Bema Seat, right? But uh, it's also called the Judgment Seat of Christ. And, and that's kind of a misnomer, right? When we hear judgment seat, we think of judgment bad, right? But, but think of it, you know, you're at an athletic competition and you have a bunch of judges that are, you know, watching the athletes, you know, compete. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe it's uh, gymnastics or, you know, or what, what do they call it? Dressage when, they, when the horses go around and jump and, and all that sort of stuff, right? You know? 
yeah, I know my sports really well, but, um, but you know, they're, they're rated on, on their performance, right? And at the end, yeah, you got a 10, you got a, you know, a zero, Darren, you know, so on and so forth, right? Second um, Corinthians chapter five, verse 10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body while we're here, right? The side of eternity, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So we're going to be judged what we've done here, the side of eternity, whether it was good or bad. The Greek word here for judgment seat is bima. That's where we get the, the, the term bima seat from, right? It means judgment seat. Um, a, bima, a bima was a raised platform on which judges sat to view athletic games. Their job was to make sure contestants followed the rules and to present awards to the victors. The bima was never a place to reprimand the athletes or to punish them in any way. It was a place of testing and reward. In the same way, the bima of Christ will not be a place of condemnation or censure. Right? But we, I don't want to be ashamed, do you, when we come before the Lord? And how close are we to the end, one? We are like, we're, we're like milliseconds away. We've got to be so, so close. Um, and verse 29 talks about that, you know, if you know, if you know Jesus is righteous, you know, if he is righteous, therefore, you know, everyone who practices righteousness is born of him, right? Now, this verse is not saying that everyone who is born of God practices righteousness, right? Otherwise, I'd be disqualified. I hate to tell you, right? And so would you. Uh, believers can walk in darkness and sin. We were, you know, we've talked about that already, you know, chapter 1, verse 6, 8, and, and uh, chapter 2, verse 1 points that out, right? But the point here is that when a child exhibits the nature of his or her father, he or she is perceived as the child of the father, right? John 13, 35 says what? By this, they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, right? Our God, our God is righteous. He's a righteous God. And if I am identified as a child of his, then what should I try to exhibit? The same, the same form of righteousness, right? Of love. Why God chooses us to share his truth to the world? <laughs> it's another one of those things that I can't wait to find out. Lord, me, really? You know? Um, Juan, maybe, but not me. But Pastor David said it rightly last Sunday. I'll quote David. He said, very, I don't know if you remember this, the very beginning of the service, before he started to teach, he said, if it sounds off, it's me. If it's right on, it's God, Right? And so, you know, brothers and sisters, when we are out there in the world and you do something that just brings glory to the Lord, right? Who did it? God did it through us, right? And when we mess up, right? It's me. I did it. You did it, right? And immediately, as soon as you know that, what are we to do? Get on your knees and repent. Just ask the Lord to forgive you. He has promised us that if you ask... He will forgive, right? And you don't have his forgiveness because you don't ask. So ask. And ask right away. Don't let these things pile up where now you've got, you know. Uh, I have a dresser in my bedroom. Things maybe once every two years I clean the top of it off. And actually, I'll admit, this, this year, um, I didn't clean it off. Christy cleaned it off. <laughs> Instead, she got tired of looking at it, right? But you know what? If every week I would just go over to it and take the stuff, the broken things off there, you know, the, the cough drop wrappers or whatever it may be, right? Or this little piece of electronics or this old battery and maybe dusted it every week. Wouldn't be a lot of work to do, would it be, every week? How, many, how long did you spend on it? I mean, you, you were doing it for, you know, an hour or so. And it's not a big dresser. I'm just talking about the top of the dresser, right? You know, you know what? Same with, same with the, our, our lives, 
You know, when you mess up, just deal with it with the Lord right away. Don't let it pile up. Because sometimes, too, we, we, we will say to ourselves, oh, I've messed up so bad that God will never forgive me. I, I, I can't come back. Then you start falling out of fellowship, and you never return, right? So on, and there's just it's a downward spiral, all right? You may still be you still saved, but you know what? Why did John say he wrote this epistle? And these things I write to you that your joy may be full. So, Father, we just thank you that you care for us, that you are a good, good Father, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for men like the Apostle John, Lord, for the Charles Stanleys, Lord, for the Rit Variales, Lord, in our lives, Lord, that want to teach us your truth, Lord. And Father, we want to leave here tonight, Lord, knowing that we have heard from you, Lord. We want to leave here tonight, Lord, changed. Father, I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that, and for myself, that if there is anything that has been left uh, unsaid between you and me, Lord, that I, that I take care of it right now in this moment, Lord. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We th thank you for that keeping power, the same power that created the world, the universe, Lord. is the same power that keeps me in the palm of your hand, Lord. Keeps each of us, Lord. So, Father, miss, may we just, Lord, just be such an example to this lost and dying world, Lord, that they would say, you are a righteous God, and there's one of your children, Lord. So, Father, just be with us, Lord, and be with those that are um, at home sick, Lord. Uh, just strengthen them, please, Lord. May they just enjoy rest with you. Father, we just thank you again. And in Jesus' name then we pray, amen.